Good afternoon, everyone. This is Michelle Clark from the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives. Welcome to the Processing County Reentry Task Force Referrals Question and Answer Webinar. I am the manager of the Vocation, Education, Employment and Reentry Unit at New York State DCJS OPCA. And I'm very happy to see all of you uh, logged on today to our really important webinar. I hope you're all safe. I hope you're all healthy. I know the governor has recently lifted quite a few uh, restrictions in our state within the last 24 hours or so. And I'm really hoping that at some point in the future, we'll all get to see each other as we used to. And um, although this virtual world is, is seemingly working out for us quite well, we've been able to <laughs> maintain our our work and, and move forward with uh, the task forces as best as we can. And I'd like to applaud all of you for how hard you have worked and your dedication and your commitment uh, through this very difficult uh, year. Uh, moving to the next slide, I'd like to uh, talk about who's going to be with us here today. Uh, myself, uh, my colleagues in the very unit, Taylor Alfred, uh, Community Correction Representative 2, Frank Cangiano, a Community Correction Representative 2 also in the very unit, and last but not least, Melinda Vick, another Community Correction Representative 2 in the very unit. I want to acknowledge also the efforts of uh, DOC staff on this on this webinar. Director Megan McTavish and Assistant Deputy Superintendent Rebecca Oy from from DOCS. To, they trained facility staff across New York State in the new pre-release CRTF referral process, um, along with the very unit staff over the past month and a half. Uh, they led the way in developing this new process, and and they are on the WebEx today. I'd like to thank them for their partnership and support, and I'm. I'm I'm sure they will be um, with us throughout the entire webinar today and the event that there may be any questions at the end uh, for, for any of us. And I'd also like to take a moment to um, uh, say that uh, although they're not listed um, on the uh, on, on this on this slide, um, I'd like to thank reentry operations managers uh, Sarah Donlin, uh, Sarah Donlin, and the assistant reentry operations manager uh, Will Smith uh, for their help with the new processes for post release cases and referrals, and for their partnership as well. Um, okay, so our webinar agenda for today includes several things. Um, we're going to go over the new CRTF referral form and the quick reference guide that was sent to you all uh, this week. Um, we're also going to go over uh, a, like a brief review of the CRTF referral process. We then have several questions that have been provided by the field, um, as well as questions that have been kind of discussed within DCJS OPCA and our, our other um, offices within DCJS um, questions by category in this webinar, as well as a live question and answer session at the end of this webinar. And any questions that we are not able to answer today, we will certainly be able to get out to all of you uh, in writing at a later time. I also wanted to mention for the purposes of this webinar that if you have any questions or comments to please place them in the chat while the presenters are giving you the information today. And at, at the end of the presentation, uh, Frank Cangiano will be gathering the questions and, and reading them out for us to be able to answer questions today and or um, give you uh, notice that we would be providing the, the answers to those questions at a later time. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to kick it off right away, we're going to talk to you about the new CRTF referral form and a, a visual of that form is here uh, for you to see. At the same time that the pre-release pre process was being modified, a work group comprised of Department of Correction and Community Supervision uh, reentry staff um, and DCJS, the Vocation, Education, Employment and Reentry Unit staff on this call today examined the current or what was the current CRTF referral form. Uh, that form uh, prior to now had a really technical feel, was not very user friendly to some, and it was also determined once we viewed um, some content in the case management system, otherwise known as CMS, uh, that DOCS uses that certain screens 
um, if provided to the CRTFs, could help us all get the information we need to complete a referral. So one of our main goals was to shorten the referral form, allowing uh, more time for assigned parole officers um, who are really, you know, working working very very hard right now, and some offices with limited staff to perform essential supervision responsibilities while continuing to refer the mod moderate to high risk and moderate to high need individuals under parole supervision and special populations to CRTF services. The utilization of this new CRTF referral form is going to be effective June 21st. I know that in um, the email that was sent out that we had said that it would be effective immediately to give uh, docs time. And because that was the original date we had all agreed upon uh, last week, we are going to officially make this form um, be effective as of June 21st. It's okay if, if some of you have been, you know, started using that form yesterday or today, we understand, but for all intents and purposes, community supervision will be using this referral form effective June 21st. Uh, parole officers will now be able to complete this uh, form electronically very easily, and they can also do it by hand if they like, and they will be able to provide supplemental documentation along with the CRTF referral form, um, and uh, Ms. Taylor Alfred will be going through those, those pieces and the slides moving forward. Um, this referral form has less content, but the information such as criminogenic and stabilization needs, which are still very important, can be found in other case file sources, such as the Compass Reentry, and even the taper, and in, especially in the new additional screens that you'll be receiving to avoid uh, duplicity. Um, parole officers will also have the uh, option to put comments into the new referral form and are encouraged to do so. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn the uh, presentation over to Taylor Alfred. Taylor? Great, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay, Michelle? I was having a little connectivity issues. Just we hear you sure. fine. We hear you fine okay. and I see people nodding their heads. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Taylor Alfred. I'm the Community Corrections Rep 2. I'm gonna walk you through some of the additional screens or documents that are gonna be included in the referral packets moving forward. So in addition to the CRTF referral, the Compass Reentry and the Taper, as part of the referral packet, you'll also be receiving four additional screens or printouts from the DOCS case management system. The contents of the screens are available on these next few slides. The first screen up here on this slide is the CMS F6 crime screen. It says exactly how it would appear in the system. The information that you may find most helpful are going to be is highlighted here in, um, in blue, but you would obviously have the name, the knife of the DIN, there's the sex offender registration. Um, if they're a sex offender, you would see if there are one, two, or three listed here. We have maximum expiration dates, ME dates, post-release supervision ME dates. You would also have a listing of the current crimes, the instant offense, the convictions for the individual, as well as the length of their sentence. Um, the sentence is always in months and years, so 05-00 to 15-00 is a 5 to 15 year sentence. There is a key here on the right hand side for any assistance you may need. The second screen on the next slide is the CMS F6 miscellaneous screen. This screen is going to have various information that's applicable to each client available, but it's not going to be the same information for each client. So it's going to be very client specific. Unlike the crime screen, that all those fields are the same for every individual. Um, other examples of content that might be on the miscellaneous screen are DMV information. There's obviously any healthcare information. If there's a uh, discharge plan, um, if they're able to vote, that would also be on here. There might also be some anger management and domestic violence um, information as well on the miscellaneous screen. So again, this screen isn't going to look or the content isn't going to be the same for every client that you receive. The third CMS F6 screen is called the narrative screen. This screen also could vary from client to client. It always starts with a brief description of the instant offense. Um, maybe there's some diagnosis section, some healthcare information, 
um, maybe any psychological information, any drugs that might um, be, a, a, any drug that the client might be taking, that could also be on here. And just so you know, when you do see the screen, the numbers on the right hand side are just line numbers for the system. They don't actually have any sort of um, meaning. So don't when you see a 102, it doesn't actually mean anything. And then the final CMS screen is the CMS background screen. And similar to the crime screen, it's going to look exactly the same for every client. Um, obviously, the information will vary, but the structure of the screen will remain the same. Um, this screen is important to note. We'll have a release date. We'll have the country where they were born, any education, IQ information, um, any sort of discharge status, as well as an OMH level. Um, so this screen will provide some additional information that's not included on the referral form and may not be included on the compass as well. So the next screen, the next slide, excuse me, is a table. And this table was included in the quick reference guide that was mailed out with the new referral or emailed out with the new referral form. And this particular table includes all the documents and the source of those documents for a pre-release referral. So as we now know, the pre-release referral process is initiated in the area, in the facility by the guidance and counseling staff. So the first two set of documents, the compass reentry and the consent form are going to be provided by facility guidance and counseling staff. The taper, the CRTF referral form, and the four additional CMS F6 screens are going to be provided by the DOCS community supervision staff. So again, um, this is for pre-release referrals, referrals that are starting while the individual is still incarcerated. The two first, the first two documents are being provided by facility staff, and the taper, the referral form, and the screens are provided by community supervision staff. The next table are for post-release referrals. So these are referrals where the individual has already been released to parole supervision, and now the referral is being initiated. All of the documents are going to be provided by the community supervision staff. So that includes the compass reentry bar chart, the taper, the consent forms, as well as the CRTF referral form and the four additional CMS screens. Um, as noted in the announcement, the of the new referral form, verbal consent is still uh, acceptable ex as long as it's documented and eventually a um, consent form is signed and placed in the case file for documentation purposes. So just to reiterate, all forms for post-release being provided by the Community Supervision Office. And lastly, we have our maximum expiration release cases. So for these referrals, referrals that are happening from the facility directly to the CRTF coordinator for individuals that are not being released to parole supervision, the facility staff is going to provide the first three set of documents. They are going to provide the compass reentry. The last available the, will be the most recently one done. There will not be a new compass done for the maximum expiration release cases. They'll also provide the paper if it's available, and they will also provide the consent forms. In addition, they're going to also provide the address, phone number, and contact information. So the CRTF coordinators will know how to contact the individual since they will not be releasing to parole supervision. Parole officers and reentry managers are not going to have access to that contact information. The CRTF referral form and the CMS F6 screens are not going to be provided for maximum expiration release referrals nor is the CRTF referral form required documentation, nor are the CMS F6 screens. And just a, just a reminder, the maximum expiration release cases, those packets are gonna be emailed directly from the facility to the CRTF coordinator. Before I turn it over to Melinda, I just wanna reiterate that 
DCJS and DOCS partnered together to train facility staff on the new pre-release referral process. You all received that, that notification, that, that process went into effect June 1st. We conducted over 20 training sessions for facility staff, um, SORCs, ORCs, deputy superintendents for programs, support staff, and now they are fully educated on the services that the CRTF provide, as well as the referral process. You may have already started to hear from some of them directly, making that connection and making that introduction. And we're really proud of the session, and the trainings that we just accomplished. And we really do feel that this new process is going to increase the number of referrals to the task force. That training was made available to the CRTFs. We will provide the link again when we send out the training materials for today's event. Um, and that will always be available for you to review, to refresh your mind on the process. And if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to your OPCA rep. So that being said, I will turn it back over to Melinda, who will take us through some of the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Taylor. I appreciate it. And good afternoon, everybody. My name is Melinda Vick. I oversee 10 out of the 20 county reentry task forces. And today I am looking forward to going over some questions. So we tried to ask you in advance, um, most of our CRTF coordinators and any of the co-chairs, if they had any questions regarding the process. We tried to send it out a little bit in advance and then asked you for some feedback. And with that, we have some questions that came. So we tried to break them up kind of logistically to, to keep it organized and hopefully go over many of the questions that hopefully a lot of you have had. So we're gonna start with the case conference committee. So one of the questions is, what if we don't have enough information about the participant slash parolee provided to us in the referral form or the CMS F6 screen? The answer is, it is important to discuss all questions and any concerns you have at the biweekly case our New York State staff will be present and in attendance and be able to answer those questions about the referral or about the individual. The case conference is going to be your time to hopefully have any answers you may have that isn't answered on the paperwork that you can ask in real time and make notes on. Next question regarding case conferences. Is it still required that we review criminogenic and stabilization needs, although they may not be noted on the new CRTF referral form? Yes, you should utilize the compass bar chart and narrative, which will allow you to review the criminogenic and stabilization needs. That is the one document that you have at your disposal to be able to do so. You should also discuss any questions with your community supervision or parole staff that will be in attendance during the case conference for any discussion on those stabilization and criminogenic needs. As some of you hopefully will recall, the stabilization and criminogenic needs are really what guide you and lead you for what exact services an individual may need to be successful or to help guide him or her in those services. Next question. The new process seems like the case conference is going to take more time to conduct. Is there a recommended number of people that should be scheduled for each meeting? No, each individual referral will be unique and you will have to utilize the information in the CRTF referral packet against the various questions you may have for service providers, service providers and or community supervision. With the changes in the process, you're going to see things either go as smoothly as they were before or you may find there's missing information and you're going to have to just adjust your case conference times accordingly. We don't wanna see a waiting list of individuals needing to be case conference. So it is strongly recommended that you review all packets in advance of the case conference so you can prepare your questions for docs representatives and or service providers prior to the case conference so you're not producing questions on the spot. The first time you lay eyes on the referral packet should not be at the case conference. While we understand that sometimes our schedules do not allow for time for a thorough review of the packets prior to the case conference, but that is the best practice is to review them in advance. It will be helpful if you are coming into the case conference with a good idea of what you need to gather with our partners at DOC, considering they are there at the case conference. It's also a golden opportunity to gather the information that you need. The next set of questions is gonna revolve around documentation. So 
Question. For maximum expiration cases, since there is no parole officer referral, will the CRTF coordinator be required to complete the CRTF referral form as required for the case file documentation? Taylor kind of already did a spoiler alert to this one, but the answer is no. The CRTF does not need to complete a CRTF referral form for maximum expiration cases. The use of the service coordination plan will suffice for case file documentation. This is a question that actually came from a coordinator. Next question. Previously, when referral was sent to us, it included a parole conditions list, which consisted of recommendations from the parole board or parole that showed what the parolee's actual mandates were. Will that remain the same? Answer. Each CRTF should discuss the sharing of additional documentation with the bureau chief, reentry manager, and or doc staff at your case conference. Again, the case conference is gonna allow you an ample opportunity to gather any information that you might need and answer any questions that you have regarding the individual that's going to be sitting before you. And now I'm going to turn it over to my supervisor, Michelle Clark. Michelle? Hi, everyone. So, okay, I'm gonna go through a few questions that we were given on the referral process itself. Um, so let's see the slide. Okay, the question. Uh, what if the CRTF contact person changes for the maximum expiration cases? How do I notify all the facilities? So the answer to that one is, if the contact person for maximum expiration referrals changes, please notify your OPCA representative because we are providing updated contact lists. Um, we're sharing them with DOCS program services um, on a routine basis or as changes occur uh, for dissemination to the correctional facilities. And the next question, thank you. What's the procedure that I'm expected to follow if DOCS sends a CRTF referral packet, but there is missing documentation? So this happens uh, quite often. Um, it, is, it is something that we try to work on individually with each of the CRTFs and, and DOCS as our partners, we, we, we don't like to see a lot, a whole lot of time between when you are given a, a consent and let's just say just the referral, but you're missing other documentation. We don't like to see the case conference held up. We don't like to see services held up. So the, the short answer is you should contact your primary contact at the docs area office. However, as I'm talking about this, and as we talked about this amongst ourselves, we, we do note that there are times that there, um, there is a length of time between when the, the CRTF coordinator or staff receive the referral and the consent, and then other information is not provided to them right away. If that occurs, it, it is our position, and we've explained this uh, before to individual uh, CRTFs, that you should uh, elevate the email perhaps, or share the email that you had sent with your contact at the DOCS area office to your DOCS co-chair for additional assistance. Um, and that, that would be our, our best um, our best response in that time. It, it, for example, a week shouldn't go by between when a CRTF um, receives a consent um, and let's say a basic referral and the rest of the referral packet. If you send an email to your docs area office on a Monday, um, I would say that you should probably send that email uh, on to the docs co-chair if 24 hours or more goes by and you don't you don't get a response. Um, we are all working um, our hardest to ensure that you, you know, that you get what you need right away, CRTF staff, um, but we're also trying to work just as hard as we know you are to ensure that individuals coming out of state incarceration are receiving services right away. So, um, nationally, what we've seen, of course, um, the model with respect to reentry is that um, the immediate um, contact or immediate connection to services is what helps individuals the most. Um, to, to be successful when they're returning to their communities. So that's our goal is to, is to expedite these services and the referrals provided to the participants in the task forces. Next question, please. Thank you. So this next question, the referral packet was never forwarded to me, but a person still contacted me for help. What do I do now? The answer would be, <coughs> of course, again, contact your primary contact at the docs area office 
If a referral packet was completed prior to release, it can be easily forwarded to you now. However, if it was an individual who has not yet been referred or who is now suddenly seeking assistance, the New York State DOC staff should be contacted so that the required paperwork can be obtained by the CRTF. Um, there are times when um, the OPC rep is contacted with respect to missing information. And if you at the CRTF level have made attempts to contact the par parole officer, sometimes the individual that's asking for help, help tells you who that parole officer is. At least you can contact the office because you know the people in your in your area office. You can actually, you know, reach out to the senior parole officer if you need to. Also, you can loop in your docs co-chair if you're feeling like you need information right away and you're having a difficult time reaching someone within the area office uh, to get you that information. So with that being said, those are the questions that we received in advance and the ones that we received um, or that we, we talked about within our, our office. Um, but at this time, I would certainly open it up to um, those of you who'd like to ask a question in the chat. And I'm going to ask that our uh, colleague, Frank Cangiano, please um, review those questions for us, um, read them to us, and then we can um, determine whether or not we can provide answers um, uh, on the spot here. Okay, so I have a couple of questions coming in. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, so. I'm going to read out these questions while still allowing other participants to uh, type in any questions that they have. Um, so the first question comes in from uh, actually Anthony Cheney Field from King CRTF. Um, Anthony is asking, uh, moving forward with the PO slash SPO, making the CRTF referral um, be required to participate in the case conferences. <clears throat> this is Michelle. Uh, we do have some docs uh, individuals on the line from community supervision, but I would say, and I'm not going to speak for them, that uh, it's not ever guaranteed that an individual will be at the case conference, a particular parole officer um, per se. Um, I think Will might be on the call, Will Smith from Long Island. Uh, would you agree, Will? Yeah, I would say that that is not the case. Just scheduling wise, it just, the, the schedule is so changeable here at parole as far as them going out on uh, emergency hits or whatever it is. It's it's always changing here, and I wouldn't expect. Yeah, I would certainly expect that there will always be someone from New York State Docs at your case conference, but it may not be the actual parole officer or SPO involved with that particular referral. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yes, and thank you very much, Michelle and, and Will, for providing uh, that joint response to the question. Uh, another question has come in from Connie Johnson, who's also involved in the King's um, CRTF. Uh, question, if you receive the, packet, the package the night before the case conference, what is the expectation on reviewing the package? Uh, so I'm assuming she's referring to the CRTF referral package. Yeah, this is Michelle again. Uh, Connie, hello. Um, you know, it's 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 not um, easy sometimes. And you know, when we get this information um, at the last minute, I realize some of these packets can be quite large. There could be a lot of information to review. What I wouldn't do is put off a case conference or like withhold a case. Um, I would certainly go to the case conference with the case in hand and try to conference that particular case in the interest of time and getting the person hooked up with services in a timely manner. And again, you do have a captive audience. You have that golden ticket that Melinda was talking about earlier with always having someone from New York State Docs at the case conference. So it's not ideal, of course, to have to go through the packet for the first time at the case conference. But if that's your only option, that that's something that you would need to do for sure. So that we don't delay um, the process of getting an individual involved in, in the CRTF. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. So I just want to allow people maybe a couple more minutes to post any more questions they have. Uh, they all, these those seem to be the only two questions that have come through so far.
I am not seeing any more questions come through, coming through in the chat to everyone. Um, if uh, Michelle, you haven't seen any being privately chatted to you or for the other reps on the call, if there's no private chat questions. I'm not um, seeing any. No, um, I would encourage anyone to um, who's received this information prior to today, which should be all of you to take a quick look at the processes, both the pre release and the post release while we're here. Um, and um, look at the CMS screens, even that were just presented to you. Um, maybe look at the quick reference guide to make sure that you're clear on on who's providing you with what moving forward. Um, I just want to make sure you all have ample time with us today. You have myself, uh, Taylor, Melinda, and Frank here to answer any questions you may have in addition to individuals from New York State Docs. So um, I'll, I'll give it a few more minutes if you'd like to. Um, Mr. Gary Brown <laughs> um, just, just mentioned that his question was already answered. And thank you for the valuable information. You're very welcome, Mr. Brown. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so again, I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to look quickly back at the emails we've sent you with the information. Um, if you have any questions about the form, the referral form itself moving forward. Um, and, and we'll just give you a few more for a few more minutes before we, we close the, the webinar. Thank you. This is Melinda Vick. I just wanted to mention to you to the CRTS, you know, this is your, your time and your ample opportunity to ask any question you'd like. And believe me, there is no dumb question. So if there's anything wandering around in your head and you're, you're nervous, please don't don't feel like that. These are your peers. And if you have that question, somebody else is going to have that question. So please feel free to throw it in the chat if you're thinking of anything. Thank you. Hi, Frank. I see a question. I see two actually. One is to me and then one is to the group. So I'll, I'll do the one to me first, if you don't mind. Not at all. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this question is about the referral form itself with respect to the comments. And again, while I, I'm, I'm not able to speak directly for, for docs per se, I believe I've worked um, with the individuals to create this form. Um, amply to be able to say that it's our expectation that a uh, parole officer or anyone else making the referral for this individual would um, make a comment with respect to criminogenic needs or a stabilization need, such as housing or a mental health referral, right in that comment section of the referral form. Um, and the question also asked about um, determining what the other needs could be. And again, going back to some of the questions that we had in this WebEx, but th that is a good question that was asked to me. You, you really have to look at the compass. And if you have questions about the compass and what those criminogenic needs are, please feel free to discuss what you're seeing in that narrative at your case conference with the DOC staff that is, that is uh, part of your committee. So thank you for that question. And there's also two questions now I see coming in. So I'll, I'll let Frank moderate them. I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm back on. If, if you need me to speak, I'm sorry oh, about that. Thank you, Will. I knew there was some technical difficulty and, and thank you very, very much. Okay, so now I see the two questions coming into everyone. First from uh, Denise Johnson. Uh, Denise indicates that she works on the sorry, Orange County. Yes, I do. Yep. I, I do have a comment I want to make that Director Fortune asked me to speak about. Okay. Uh, I don't okay, know if that now is the appropriate time. Should I wait? I don't know. What What do you think is best? You can certainly go ahead. Will. we'll we'll hold the question for a moment. Sure. So the one thing I did want to uh, let everyone know is for the ME cases. Community supervision will have no role in that. Uh, that's right. we're not involved with that. That will just be the facility staff that's involved with that. So yes. We wanted to make that clear. 
So thanks. If there's Absolutely. any other comments you want me to make, I'll be glad to at any time. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you very much. So now we have a question coming in from uh, Denise Johnson. Uh, Denise asks that she works for Orange County, New York, and she noticed a referral that came through for a Sullivan County person. Uh, can her CRTF, which is RN CRTF, service them? Well, unfortunately, no. So uh, the, the county rentry task forces operate, you know, within the county that's funded, and um, an individual returning to Sullivan County um, cannot um, be served um, by the Orange County Rentry Task Force. And Denise, we can talk to you about that. You can certainly talk to Taylor about that uh, offline. Um, we get questions a lot throughout the state about whether or not people that live in other counties can get services from one of the funded counties. And unfortunately, that's not uh, permissible. So um, we can certainly talk about that um, with you um, on ways to assist someone who's not in your county. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Michelle, this is Megan. Could sure. I just interject there as well? Of course. If, um, if you find that that potentially was a max expiration case that may have been, you know, not referred correctly, could you let us know so we can follow back up with the facility? You know, I just would like to express as well, you know, appreciation um, to the county reentry task force coordinators and reentry managers during. This transition time, you know, we've already um, been communicating with community supervision staff and working through some issues. We really appreciate that communication and we'll follow up on any issues um, with facility staff and just um, appreciate as we work through this. Thank you. Thank you, Director McTavish. So, for those of you who don't recognize the voice, <laughs> that was Director Megan McTavish from New York State Docs. So, that's important, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Director McTavish. So, if that perhaps may have been a max, maximum expiration case, Denise, um, that's important for you to share uh, with Taylor and or uh, Docs or even your ranch operations if you'd like to, and then we'll get that information to Guidance and Director McTavish's uh, team. If you were to see um, max X pace cases come to your county from a different uh, with a person who's residing in a different county. That covers it right director McTavish. Yes, thank you. Okay, very much. no problem. Thank you. Frank. Our next question comes in from uh, Mercedes Jordan. She's asking about. Um, the process itself and documentation. Um, Mercedes indicates that the documentation. Um, that's presented here is a slight change in the documentation that the PO submits. Um, and, and also she's asking, should, should she or the CRTS be retraining doc staff on this process as well? Is this a senior, senior parole officer, Mercedes Jordan in Erie? That's who it is, I believe, correct? Good to, good to hear from you, Mercedes. Uh, you know, that, that is a great question. Um, and I believe that question would probably need to go um, up your uh, chain, I believe, um, for, for proper answering. Um, certainly, New York State DCJS, um, my staff and myself would be happy to help in any way we could um, on this process. So, um, yeah, <laughs> we're chatting now. <laughs> Hi, Mercedes. So, you know, that would be a question I would certainly um, I would raise in, in, your, in your office. And I appreciate you asking that. And I think it's important. And I think it's a really good idea. I think there might be a few more questions coming in. Yep, there is a question um, from Gary Brown. Um, indicating there was a question that arose in our last case conference. Um, he asking if the New York CRTF services individuals who are convicted of sex offenses. Yes, we are. We, the, the county rentry task force model does allow for individuals who are convicted of sex offenses to be served by the county rentry task forces. And if you have questions about that, Gary, please feel free to contact Taylor. I'm just going to give. Thank you very much, Michelle. I'm just going to give the uh, the group maybe a couple more minutes to ask any any other questions that they have. I think the questions that have come in are really great questions. It, it obviously 
is apparent that um, you have all given a lot of thought to this process and and really have attributed much of what's in this presentation to your own CRTS and the work that you do um, in, in drafting these questions to us. And I think it's, it's really great to see that we're having this open dialogue and answering these questions. Agreed. Um, with that being said, Frank, um, we could move on, uh, Taylor, actually to the next slide um, to give everyone um, the contact information um, for OPCA, um, DCJS uh, reps here. Uh, myself, uh, Taylor Alfred, who covers uh, 10 um, county entry task forces, and Melinda Vick, who covers the other 10 county entry task forces. Uh, Frank, who certainly has a lot of experience <laughs> with the county rancher task forces, you can contact us all at any time that you need to. This goes for um, New York State Docs staff as well. If you ever have any questions for us, um, uh, county co-chairs as well, uh, Docs co-chairs, uh, CRTF staff and coordinators, please feel free to um, write to us individually uh, or as a group if you need information. I also want to um, remind you all that there is a list serve that you're all a part of that you could certainly um, write questions um, about things that um, are not specifically contract related, but maybe questions on best practice or ways to garner um, more more individuals for groups, um, whether or not you're running CBIs or already set work, um, just general questions about um, sharing your experiences and sharing information on the work you do on the list service is very much supported uh, by OPCA as well. Um, so with that, I, I wanna say, since there are no more questions coming in, I really appreciate each and every one of you being with us today. Um, I want to thank again New York State Docs for your partnership and for how much work you've done over the past several months uh, reworking the pre-release process, um, getting facility staff trained, as well as uh, re-entry operations, Sarah Donlin and, and Will Smith, and helping us with our referral form and on the post-release process. We, we really appreciate um, all of your, your help. And thank you again to the CRTF staff across the state. You're doing a really great job. Thank you very much.